And uh, as I said, we're redoing our website. So we, we're thinking of like SEO and, and what the questions are that might come up. And one of these questions is Madison. Are, are, is that is Madison your first name or is Madison? Oh, by Maddie. 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 Okay, cool. Wow. Maddie at Madison. <laughs> I'm sure nobody's ever mentioned that. I'm just an observant Jew. What can I say? I notice these things. Uh, so um, that is one of the topics that we're going to try and address. What exactly is a dating coach? Why would somebody need a dating coach? Is a dating coach even worth it? It's really interesting how many people have Googled, why would I need a dating coach? There's like a question on Quora Valley. Like, but you totally need, I mean, not, I don't know. I mean, I, I think anybody who would use my wife would be very well off. Okay, but like I said, not going to steal your thunder. What I'd like to do is to dive right into our presentation. And for that, what I'm going to do is to share my screens. Just give me a second here. Um, I'm going to go back and forth. Okay. Do you all see the, uh, the PowerPoint here? Okay, so we're, we're gonna do a little game here to get ourselves started. And that is, I want to get your feedback initially on some basic questions. So to do that, I want you to go to bit.ly, bit.ly slash MIMO love. And I am going to post some questions there. Okay. Uh, is everybody there at bit.ly slash mono love? Okay, good stuff. So we are now going to activate the first question. Do you all uh, see the question there? Yes. Okay, so again, this is completely anonymous. Nobody will ever know. But we just want to get like a basic sense of where people are at. Incidentally, it's a holiday, L'chaim, L'chaim people. Wow, we have a perfect distribution right now. Oh. <laughs> okay, so uh, once again, the, the question is, uh, how would you relate your relationship life? Uh, one, like, don't ask, get away from me. Uh, can we talk about anything else? Can we talk about COVID? I mean, like something, please, but just not relationships. Right. And, and five is like, oh my gosh, I totally got this down. <laughs> Yo. Um, so th this is actually, I would say a better distribution than what we typically see on, on college campuses. Uh, so this is skewed towards um, a, uh, a negative distribution. Uh, typically it's, it's like heavily skewed towards a negative distribution. Um, so what I'd, I'd like to do now is to uh, ask another question. And remember again, uh, this is completely anonymous, um, but it will allow us all to sort of have a window into each other's uh, lives and, and understand a little bit more about what we're actually experiencing with relationships. So do you all see that question now, this next question? What do you find most challenging about romantic relationships? Huge. Interesting. The long distance relationship right there. Oof. I'll bet that's great. Typical compromise, good. Okay, excellent, excellent. Some, uh, some really good, solid, honest responses. Okay, 
Now I'm going to ask two questions just totally for the fun of it. Like I, I'm just really curious to see what your thoughts are. Next question up. Do modern relationships, do, does our modern relationship culture, right? So you guys are on campus, you're sort of living the campus life, the relationship culture on campus. Does it favor guys or girls more? What would you say? Or is, is it a, okay. Fairly typical distribution. If anything, I would say it actually gives the girls too much credit. <laughs> and I, I've noticed there, there are quite a few girls here on, on this uh, poll, but I'd say even when guys are involved and when they're honest, um, they recognize that it, they, it favors them. And, and one final question before we dive in, uh, and let me throw that up, is, oh, here we are. Well, before I, uh, okay, so I just posted that next question, um, but I do want to introduce my better half, Rachel, right. as I said, the dating Hello. coach. Hi, everybody. Okay, so we, we asked a bunch of questions. The most recent question was, what do you think the modern relationship context tends to favor? Is it guys or girls? Okay. And it was 70, 30 guys, which I would say is probably a little overly skewed for, for um, girls. And it's girls usually we'll get less than 30% in the vote that we've seen. Okay. So the, the question is, why do you think that that poll came out? Like in, in what ways do you think that the relationship culture favors guys or, or creates a difficult environment for girls to find what it is that they're looking for and what they truly want in relationships? With their answering now? As yeah, yeah. Okay. So as the answers come oh, up, I'm trying to be anonymous, okay. it'll pop up. Okay. Can I offer you some bigger? Haven't we seen that a bunch of times? Mm -hmm. Can everyone see everyone's answers? Yeah, oh. yeah, as they come up. Okay, and that was, yeah, got it. And we also asked, mm, wow, oof, big. No, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for being so blunt. I mean, if we can't be blunt, we're. Hmm. Interesting. Status. The other questions that we asked were, um, how's, how's your relationship life? And we got like a, a distribution that was slightly skewed to the, the, the um, negative end, um, which I think is actually atypical. So quality, they're having better relationships than us. And um, the next question was, what do you find difficult in relationships? We had a lot of honesty, communication, being able to be open. I can't really. Um, a... Well, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to leave this live, and in the meantime, I'm going to go to the... Oh, interesting. I can't see the last word. Um, so it's cut off. Interesting. Okay. So again, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. I'm going to go back to our uh, our slide presentation, and uh, we'll we'll pick it up. But that was a you know, really interesting exercise. Thank you so much for all participating in that. Okay, so uh, if you are with me now, you should be seeing an older dude uh, sitting in front of his house. Do you all see our friend, the older dude? <laughs> Okay, so what the heck does this have to do with relationships? No guys, no girls, I'm not suggesting that if you can't find a guy 
Like, just go older. <laughs> That's not the point here. But let me, let me tell you the story about the old dude and what I think it has to do with relationships. So I read as a kid, like a bajillion years. Well, I'm not that old. I mean, Chai Esther knows exactly. She's been around since. <laughs> but a long time ago, I read a story about, it was like a, a fable kind of story about this guy who, uh, this, he, he, it's like a Jack and the Beanstalk variation. It's like a, like a riff. You know how like they make these, um, uh, a series of stories, you know, like now there's um, uh, Star Wars stories that are not part of Star Wars. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out exactly how that works. But the point is, it was like a, a Jack and the Beanstalk, not Jack and the Beanstalk story. And the point is the guy sells his cow and um, and his mother like kicks him out of the house. And now he's got to go uh, get back in the house. And to do that, he has to go traveling the world and trying to, you know, find enough money to buy a cow so his mother will let him live back in the house and he winds up doing magical things and whatever. But along the way, he comes across the following bizarre scene. There's an older guy who's sitting on the porch uh, in, a, in a, um, a rocking chair. And there's this older woman who's standing above him and she's holding a big log in her hand. And uh, as this guy is sort of like sitting there in the chair, she comes crashing down on his head with the log and he yells, ow! <laughs> and then she does it again. He yells, ow! And she's like, don't worry, honey, it's not much more. And he's like, okay, okay, ow! I'm telling you, we're gonna get there soon, ow! So he runs up to her, he says, what is going on here? I mean, can I help you? Is there a problem? So the woman says, well, you know, um, I, I know how to sew, but I guess like the day that, that um, they were teaching uh, how to make collars, like uh, I was uh, in social distancing too soon, too soon. And uh, I, I didn't learn how to make collars. So what I do is every year I make my husband a new shirt and what I, I just kind of smack him over the head until there's like a tear in the shirt and then we you know, get his head through. And that, that's how he has a, a collar and a shirt. <laughs> So the guy says, well, you know, I, I actually can teach you uh, how to make a collar. Like, what's that worth to you? And this guy's like, whoa, you know, you can have the farm. Um, and, and he teaches her how to make a collar and, and he makes a lot of money. And then he goes and spends it on the magical beans and his bones get ground or whatever the story is. But that's not important. The important part of the story is that there are better and worse ways to make a collar in your shirt. And one of the bloodiest worst ways is to get banged over the head with a log. Uh, and then th there's a whole variety of like ways from that to, you know, to like sort of modern collars, you know, you can just like rip it open with a razor blade, you can use the scissors, um, you know, you can get your like, I don't know, kid brother to like do some like uh, experiment with his glue and whatever else and, and maybe that works, right. And then, you know, there's like sort of properly making a collar. What this has to do with the relationships is that there is a huge variety of ways in which to enter into and to navigate relationships. And some of them leave people literally feeling like that dude, this dude on the porch who's getting whacked over the head with the log. It, it's just so painful. I mean, statistically, people will go, to, go through six to seven serious relationships before they settle down and get married. Now, even if for you, like marriage is off like in the 40s or 50s, like that's fine, but the point is, I imagine most of you at some point want to settle down and there are all these relationships that are going to happen between now and then if people don't have the right tools for navigating those relationships that can be extraordinarily painful. It can be a lot of heartbreak and a lot of scar tissue. I can tell you, I know about scar tissue. I was cutting an onion earlier this year and I, I cut off my thumb almost the entire way. And now like my entire thumb, you wouldn't know it because I have a good surgeon, God bless him, but it's mostly scar tissue and it feels mad weird. So just imagine if your heart goes through that, right? You've been through these relationships where you've had your heart broken again and again, and you've developed all this scar tissue. It, it's rough. So the point of today's discussion is to try to find better ways of navigating relationships. Are you going to have a perfectly sewn collar done by you know an, an experienced uh, Italian tailor who's been sewing collars for, you know, in his family for three generations? Probably not. But again, we don't want you to be, to be whacked over the head. So let's try to take some Jewish wisdom. Let's take some ideas. Let's learn about them, talk uh, about them, uh, question them, uh, struggle with them together. And hopefully on the other end, we'll wind up with some tools that will allow us to have a much better relationship experience over the course of however many years we're gonna be going through this uh, relationship navigation. So with that, I want to dive into a very big basic question and that is, 
I know you're all thinking, you, you, you've got that tune in your mind, right? Like, what is love, right? So I know, baby, don't hurt me, right? Okay, but, but really, let's try to uh, ask ourselves, what is love? And, and this, you, you don't have to answer anonymously. I, I really want to hear from you, how would you define love? I mean, we're all, we're looking for love. I mean, we want love when we find it, it's mad awesome. Um, but, but if you don't know what it is, you can't find it. It's like, you know, when my wife and I start off on a drive and we're, you know, we're taking a road trip someplace, like, yeah, she, the first thing she always asks, I'm, I'm sort of absent-minded this way, like, you know, get in the car, we drive. She's like, Oz, what's the address? I'm like, whatever, you know, you take the highway. She's like, no, what's the address? You put it in ways and then you know where you're going. So if you know what love is, if you can define love, then you can hopefully navigate towards love. But if you don't have that defined, it becomes so much more challenging. You might not wind up like me without, you know, my wife telling me you know, to put stuff in ways. I'd be driving all over the place. So I want to open it up to you now and ask you, what are your thoughts? What would you say uh, love is? Can I unmute now? Uh, I, nobody's muted. Are we can, just to talk? Yeah, please. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. So, um, Hi everyone, I'm Sam. Just a little bit about me. I've been out of college now for about five years. Um, so I think that I have had, I've had a lot of heartbreak um, and I am very fortunate to know what love is in terms of familial love and my parents have a wonderful relationship. And I think that they challenge each other constructively to, um, you know, be better versions of themselves. I mean, they've got a lot of their own issues, but um, I had great examples from my grandparents and they were always there for each other um, and just always encouraging the other one to be a better version of themselves, but still loving the other person like almost more than they love themselves. And for me, I would love to be able to have that relationship and be wholly myself. And I think it's really, it's really difficult to navigate, you know, the crazy like political landscape or like just the landscape right now where there's so much like, I, I feel like even in college and now I'm 29, it's almost frowned upon or like taboo to say that I would like to be a mother and I'd like to have a family and, and all these things. It almost makes you like a, pariah. And I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but um, I had a really good example and I have a good example of what it's like to be loved, you know, by a husband, like and wife, like seeing as my parents. And that's what I, I would like to have. I don't know if that really answers the question. It's kind of high Wait, level. Well, no, but, excellent. So yeah. Samantha, I'm going to try something that I've learned in communication, being married to a dating coach, is uh, that you, you try to reflect back what you hear. We're uh, active listening. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to try to actively listen and, and reflect back what I think I heard. Um, I think what, what I've heard, Samantha, is that you are looking for a very specific type of love that's a sustainable love, the kind of love that can be the, the foundation of a, a familial a relationship where, where you, that love is what allows you to build a family and to have children and to create a home. And what you've seen is that the components of that love are an investment in each other and improving each other and a willingness to give beyond what, what you would take. Is that about right? Yeah, absolutely. I love that when you're able to articulate what I may not have been able to articulate by mind sometimes is so much faster than my mouth. And I think that happens a lot of people and I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope I got my message across. So. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. I'm just going to jump in here just very quickly and say, that what you're looking for is just definitely out there, but it's harder to find. But don't don't get despondent just because it's harder to find, because good things are harder to come by and harder to find. But when you find it, it'll be much more meaningful and worthwhile. Easier to, easier to find glass than to find diamonds. Very true. Where's the diamond? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Anyone else? I want to hear from the guys. Where are the guys? Nathan? Guys. I see a Nathan. Nathan Hamowitz. I see a Charles. And Charles. It looks like Nathan's trying to talk, but he's on mute. Oh, oh, oh did I put a, anybody on mute? I think you put everyone on mute. Did, you have to, un, you oh, have to unmute. Wow, I'm really, I really didn't do much for my 
tech savviness image. Um, I, uh, I think love is a commitment. Um, I think love is a, like a, an ongoing negotiation where you give um, part of yourself and someone else gives a part of them to make um, uh, a loving unit. I, I think you do lose a lot of individuality um, when you um, give into love. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I'm talking about more about romantic love. Right. That's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I think there are many types of love, but like for romantic love, I do think it's, um, it requires more than other things, um, a lot of selflessness. Um, and it's one of the few loves where it ha I think happens very intentionally, whereas maybe uh, friend love or um, familial love um, or love of occupation, hobbies, I think those happen in a very, um, not accidental, but very, uh, it, it, it's less, it's, it's less uh, built up, but with, with, you can identify, you can discern what you're looking for when it comes to uh, a romantic love, a sexual love. Um, and I think that uh, makes, means that you need to be very um, uh, intentional about how you go about it. Okay, interesting. So Nathan, first, I want to recommend to you a, a fantastic book because you brought up the different kinds of love. It's a book by C.K. Lewis, the, the yes, Lewis. From Narnia. Uh, yeah, I just read it. Uh, the Four Loves? Yeah, I just read oh, it. Oh, amazing. I thought that nobody else in the universe read that. I thought it was like- It was rock. phenomenal. I ate it up. I read it twice over winter break. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Nathan, we should schmooze. Okay. Um, so- Excellent. So what I'm hearing from Nathan is that, and it's interesting how you you combine romantic love and sexual love, and, and there's obviously a very strong relationship between those two. Um, and there's an entire question if you can have romantic love that's not sexual. Um, but what you would say is that regardless for either of them, there is essentially becoming part of a corporate whole that is bigger than the individual. And it's the willingness to lose yourself into the corporate whole that is what creates that love. Is that about right? Right, that's a, that's a core tenant, I think. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Let's go to the more people Let's see. Here. We got a- Charles. Um, Ariel, Samantha, Cassie, Rachel. Okay. So quiet, guys. Well, you'd have to unmute them. Otherwise. No, 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 they can unmute themselves. Oh, they can be all unmute them. themselves. I guess with um, something that I thought about is that communication plays like a big role in love um, and not just like the lust, but the actual where, you know, committed um, lifelong and um, see a future together. And so I think it's kind of like you respect the person and you respect uh, the limitations they have, but you, um, the the good outweighs the the bad you know you're you're willing to overlook it because you really uh really care for them um i don't really think that it it has to do everything with um you know like the honeymoon stage and everything like that i think it happens after you've spent years together and you've learned to uh work together as like partners and so what I have to say. Um, extraordinarily mature. I got to mm -hmm. say, Rachel, uh, you know, uh, that, that is, you know, somebody who's been doing this marriage thing for over a decade. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd have to say that uh, that is um, certainly a, um, a relationship that's, that, that the relationship you describe is one of stability. Um, and what you're, uh, just to reflect back, I think what I hear you saying is that love is more in, in, in action. It's more in a form of consistently relating to somebody in a way that's forgiving and that's open and that draws the other person in. Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you a, uh, a quote from Maimonides about love. And it's, it's interesting because it's not about love of, uh, not about romantic love, not about sexual love. It's actually about the love of God. And it is from this quote that I think we can draw a general principle about love that can be applied to really any kind of relationship. So this is in contradistinction to that book I, I recommended by C.K. Lewis, who talks about the four loves, you know, story, agape, whatever, without getting into that. There is a, a powerful common denominator in all love, 
And we're actually going to do a little thought experiment where we're going to see if this definition works with people whom we love, not necessarily romantically, but just people that we love. So moving on, um, can you all see this uh, quote from Maimonides now? Yes. Okay, excellent. So I'll, I'll just read it out loud. Uh, when man will reflect concerning, he's talking about God. He says, when man will reflect concerning his works and his great and wonderful creatures and will behold through them his wonderful, matchless, and infinite wisdom, he will spontaneously be filled with love, praise and exult exultation, and become possessed of a great longing to know the great name. Even as David said, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So Maimonides is describing the way in which romance develops. Now, this is like sort of the dead last romance that somebody ever plans to find, like going into a bar on a weekend. <laughs> but at the same time, I think there's a powerful lesson here that all of us can take about the genesis of love. You know, if you reflect on this quote of Maimonides, what would you say is the basis of love? Where does love begin? You can take some time, just, you know. I'm sorry? I, fr from Hashem. So does, does Maimonides say that Hashem, that God seeds this love, that he creates the love, or that we develop the love ourselves? Well, he's saying that because of Hashem's creation, when we reflect on it, we are filled spontaneously, sort of like in awe of all that's around us. And so I think that it's not, he's not saying that Hashem, like, you know, puts this seed in our mind and has sort of a grand plan to give us this love. But I think that if we're able to reflect even subconsciously or inadvertently and realize all that's around us and sort of like how amazing it is, then, I mean, it comes from Hashem, but I'm not saying that he's like orchestrating it. Okay, interesting. So first, just to use the term, and, and also I, I wanted just a, a process point. Although I'm speaking a lot at this at this. Uh, sort of front loaded the front of the presentation. Rachel's yeah. uh, part is going to be soon. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm very used to being Rachel's accessory, especially when it comes to uh, talks about relationships. <laughs> I just kind of smile like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever she said. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I thank you for giving me the support now. Um, but uh, so Samantha uh, used the term, I don't know if all of you are familiar with it, the term Hashem, which refers to God. It, it literally means the name, and it's sort of a more traditional name that's used. Uh, for God when we're talking about him, it's just easier to refer to the name than actually use any of the, the names of God. But what Samantha is saying is that there is um, there's something in the experience of God that sparks love and that we experience with him. But I, I want to drill down a little bit more. Like, where does this start? H how did it begin? And I think that, that Maimonides, if we read this carefully, he, he actually he lays out a bit of a roadmap as to how we get there. Maddie, we haven't heard from you in a little while, so what do you think? Um, I'm trying to understand the quote. Okay. So Maimonides says when, a, when somebody, if somebody wants to develop love for God, so what they, they begin doing is they reflect on creation and they say like, you know, this is a, it's a pretty amazing place. I mean, even when we're all locked down because of COVID, I mean, thankfully none of us are starving. Um, now certainly there are people that have food insecurity and so on, but like, you know, th there are people who are dying. It's awful, but like, compared to what's happened in the past with plagues. I mean, Spanish flu, 50 to 100 million people died. Like, I don't mean to make light of, you know, 25, 23, 20, whatever it is, thousand people, but like, you know, this, this could be devastatingly worse. I mean, there were plague, the Black Plague killed out a third of Europe. Like, and, and on top of that, you know, we're living in homes that have central heat, central air. Like, you know, we, we go outside, we have fresh air, we can full exercise, we can access the world through the internet. Like we live in a in a, an extraordinary world, and and just the the you know the Chayester, as you know, recently had a child. You, you, uh, so we uh, we have two of ours, uh, little ones, and and just like the delight that you experience with a child, um, with studying something new, with with experiencing a new day. So the love that that Maimonides describes that we develop for God is when we reflect on His world. We say, "This is extraordinary." Like. 
I, I can't believe who, like who's who's behind this. Let me give you a um, let me give you a practical example. You know, have you ever um, gone to like a family party? I, mean, I don't know. It's like Thanksgiving or Hanukkah or whatever Passover on you know a normal year, and you know sometimes you come and everybody sort of like gathers around and they have like paper plates and like you know there's like takeout and some deli and whatever, some uh, some bagels and, and schmear, you know, so we do our Jewish thing, right? And sometimes you come and like every little detail has been thought of. Like everybody has a little name card that's that's written in calligraphy and, you know, the the the, the table is set beautifully and, and there's just flowers and, and like, you know, that everything is home cooked and it's just done to perfection. And, and like course after course, and, and you have your favorite dessert and, and there's also healthy options and, and there are vegan options. And like, you know, how do you feel about the family member that organized the first party versus the family member that organized the second party? When you see what the person has done and how much effort they put in, you're so appreciative. You feel connected to them. So what I would like to, to use is a working definition of love. Yeah, did you want to? based on Maimonides, and that is that love is the attachment that results from deeply appreciating another's goodness. The attachment that results from deeply appreciating another's goodness. Now, I want to bring a second quote, and then we're going to try this on for size. The second quote is from a Mishnah in Ethics of, of uh, I'm sorry, the Midrash. A Midrash is sort of like a, a collection of uh, traditions that have been passed down of, of um, analyses of verses and so on, which is you know, sort of part of our given tradition. And it, it was written down roughly 2000 years ago. So this is like pretty authoritative stuff. It says, uh, any love that is dependent, when the object of dependence is lost, the love is lost. Okay, again, so any love that is dependent, when the object of dependence is lost, the love is lost. Which is a love that is dependent? So it gives an example, the love of Bilam and Balak, the king of Moab, they were like in bed together to try to, not literally, but they, they were trying to destroy the Jewish people. So Balak hired Bilam to curse the Jewish people. And any love that is non-dependent will not be lost forever. And that's the example of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob but, uh, in the love that they had for their children, their descendants until the end of generations, right? So the, any love that's dependent on something other than the love of the, uh, the appreciation of the other person's goodness. When that goodness, when, when that thing is gone, that love is gone, right? So like, you know, sort of the classic example, you know, dating the uh, captain of the, I don't know, the lacrosse team, right? If he's no longer the captain of the lacrosse team or he gets an injury, like who, who wants him, you know? Like whatever, just move on to the captain of the football team. Right? So if it's dependent on something, when that thing is lost, the love is lost. But if it's not dependent on anything other than that person's inherent goodness, then the love never goes anywhere. So what I wanna ask ourselves is to see if this actually, this def definition actually works for us. Think about some of the people you love most. And I wanna hear from some of the people that I haven't heard from yet. I, I see there's a Cassie, there's a Charles, there's an Ariel, they're, they're being awfully quiet. I'm starting to, wonder if they're just bots or if they actually exist. So I want you to, to chime in here and tell me about somebody you love, um, not, not necessarily romantically, but somebody, you know, it could be a grandparent, it could be a teacher, it could be, you know, anybody, a friend. And if, when you get down to it, what is it that you really, really love about them? So to those people that have not spoken yet, sing it out, people. Um, I think that like, I love my mom the most, and I think that I love her because of, like, the way in which, like, I look up to her and, like, how she's, like, a role model for me and how, like, I want to, like, be like her when I'm, like, older and, like, a mother to my children. Right. Yeah, so just imagine, Maddie, you know, what if, I don't know, uh, you know, you had to take a job in Singapore or something and, and you, like, didn't see your mother for, I don't know, for a year or two years. What if you couldn't even reach her? Like, do, would you lose any of that love? No, but I, no. I mean, it'd be tough, right? I'd but, be sad. I don't yeah, think I'd course. lose the love though. I think I'd probably maybe even like grow strong, like grow stronger because I'd miss her so much, you know? Right. And because that you'd appreciate, you know, probably being in a new situation, being around new people, you know, you, you appreciate the things that you had. 
and the, the people that you loved and were connected to. Okay, how about Charles, Cassie, or Ariel? Like going along with that, I think just like my, for me, like for example, I love my parents and their um, like capability to let go of everything for me and my sister and just like give their all no matter what. And it like feels good and like to go along with your working definition of love, like we're able to give that back to them because like we're receiving, if that makes sense. Excellent. Very good. Anybody else? This might be yeah this might be kind of like a cheesy answer but i really love my dog um you know even though we can't like communicate with each other the same way humans can communicate he gives me unconditional love no matter what's going on in my life and so it's really nice to have something like that stable in your life and he's just like a constant so he's great thanks for sharing is yeah. we, have a, we have a brianna here also and uh i would encourage her to speak up if uh, <laughs> She has any, any thoughts on this as well? I didn't mean to leave you out. I just oh, no. only have a limited number of uh, thumbnails I'm seeing here. Um, I guess who I love the most would be my grandparents. Um, from both sides, you know, they've done a lot for my family and both of my grandmothers are my best friends. Um, and, you know, I've been away from them. Like my one grandma, she moved back to Mexico and it's still hard. You know, I can't talk to her all the time, but you know, the love is still there. Like, I still miss her. I miss going home and getting, like, home-cooked meals for her from her. And whenever I go back to Mexico, I get to see her. And, you know, our bond is still there. Like, nothing changes. Um, we're still pretty much, like, best friends. There you go. Because if it's not dependent on anything other than who the person really is and the relationship that you have, then no matter what happens, the love is still going to be there. Now, the question I have, the follow-up question is, what is today's dating optimized for? That is to say, what does today's dating help us discover about others and what aspects of individuals are highly valuable in our dating world, right? So there's a, a bit of a leading question and it actually leads into to the next part of the presentation because yeah, I wanna make sure that we have enough time to, to touch on what, uh, what is really Rachel's uh, unique expertise. Um, but Based on that definition of love, I think it would be fair to ask ourselves, does our society optimize the dating environment so that we can find love in that way? We can identify other people's goodness so that we can best uncover the different ways in which different people are good, which people are really good and which people are maybe not as good. Or is it the case that the goodest of the people tend to you know, have all the guys and girls running after them because, because they clearly are the ones who are most love worthy or, or is that not quite how the, the society structures, you know, the, the, the dating game. Uh, and, and that becomes a, a huge issue because, I mean, ultimately we, we have to play the game we were handed, right? Like that's, that's the dating reality. And uh, therefore we would uh, have to, kind of work with um, the, the, like I said, we, you know, we, we just have what we have. And therefore, we have to do what we can to make sure that we're finding what it is that's most important in a relationship. If we're looking in a relationship for the kind of love that will not be dependent on anything, that will last, how do we best find that? What are the best ways to find that? Uh, what are the best ways to find within a person that you're dating, whether they have that or not? Those are all, I think, really, really important corollary questions from the questions we brought up. But uh, what I want to do now is, is hand over, uh, hand this over to Rachel, and uh, have get her perspective on some some issues, some uh, dynamics that you might uh, be familiar with in traditional relationships and traditional dating. Since you might have noticed, you know, Chayester's traditional kind of gal, I'm a you know traditional guy. Um, you know, we, we do the whole observant thing and so on. Um, and extremists. <laughs> right. We're fanatic that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, there, yeah, whether you watched Unorthodox or you've read things or you've heard things, you, you probably have questions about like, why is it that the relationship and the sort of more traditional um, world are the way they are? And, and let me mention, it's not like these, like we're, we're, 
uh, cooked up in, in some rabbinic basement, like in the 60s. And, you know, so a bunch of bearded, black-hatted dudes said like, hey, like this sounds like fun. Why don't we create the shidduch? And why don't we create the matchmaker, Yentl's now created out of whole cloth in Brooklyn and spawned on the world, right? These are patterns in relationships and dating that existed for, you know, hundreds or, or even some thousands of years. Uh, and therefore, I think in, in trying to understand them, even in a modern context, there's a lot of important lessons we can take. So I want to talk about some key relationships, uh, differences between traditional Jewish relationships and general relationships, and then and hand it over to Rachel. Um, so there is, uh, you might have heard of the matchmaker, the Shadchan. Um, the, you might have heard of shidduch dating. Um, that is not bad language, my friends. A shidduch means um, a, a match, right? And nigia, this idea that there's Within traditional circles, there's no physical contact before marriage. Like, whoa. Um, so uh, to do that, I, I want to, to uh, hand it over to Rachel and um, introduce uh, Vitruvian Man. And Rachel's going to talk about some parts in particular. <laughs> this is a slide you give me. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, for the waist up. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, Rachel Burnham here. This is my... Uh, better half here, other half, better half. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you want to do the headphone? Yeah. Okay. So, I, I don't think I really need to go through secular dating and how that goes. You guys know that on your own. But an easy way that I found to kind of explain to people who are just kind of exploring Judaism for the first time or of the beginning, in the beginning, um, is this concept of hand to heart to head. So, the way it works is that you know, in the secular world, typically what happens is we are physically attracted to somebody, we might be, um, you know, caught by their look, we might be excited about their personality. It's not just a physical thing, but it could just be like an external thing, their personality, the way they carry themselves, the way they interact with others. Um, and so we might approach them, get a relationship going, and that goes on for a while, we kind of, you know, see if we're interested in starting a relationship, but then finally we get into a relationship with them, however long you know, a couple decides until they're ready. Um, and then they'll date for months and years until they decide that they have fallen in love. Um, now we've fallen in love and that goes on for a while too. Um, and then after I'm attracted to them, you know, we understand each other, we appreciate each other. Um, I'm in love with them, we're dating for years, and then it's kind of a, well, let's see, next normal step would be like, should we get married? So then we start thinking about like, do we have similar kind of common goals and values? Do you want children? Do you want to raise them traditional? Do you, um, you know, you want to, you want to live in the, you know, on a farm or do you want to live in the city? I mean, these are just basic goals and values you want to find out if this person has in common with you. The problem is, is that by the time you've actually gotten to that point, you're already super committed. You're, you've physically been very committed to this person. Your heart is completely, you know, given over to this person. And like, now you find out that I don't want to have children and he wants a family. Um, and so what typically happens is either the couple breaks up over it, um, or one side tends to kind of, um, kind of give in and say, okay, fine. So we, we won't live in the city. I'm a city girl, but you want to live on a farm. You want to live, you know, out in rural America. Like, hey, uh, they're in Wisconsin. It's cool. Like, right. So, um, <laughs> nothing wrong with dairy. <laughs> Just saying. So one side will give in in order to like make the relationship work because at that point they're so committed. They don't want to let go of the relationship, um, which causes significant, uh, complications later on as we'll get into, um, and then the other option in terms of how traditional Jewish dating works is completely the opposite direction. So it goes from head to heart to hand. So first I think about before I even met this person, you know, hey, you want to go out with Joe? Well, tell me about Joe. Well, he's got some similar values to you and, and you guys have similar interests. Um, he's really kind. He's really warm and he's really intellectual, very intelligent. He's very career driven. Um, he's very spiritual. So those are the kind of reasons why I thought you might want to go out with him. All right, well, I'll give it a date. So the couple goes out and um, they find out like, wow, actually like I'm attracted to him. He's got a great personality. We really hit it off. We got great chemistry. And considering that all these kind of goals and values are in place and they're really wanting the same thing out of life, which they've actually looked into before, because there's a lot of research that goes on before a couple even goes out to see if all those goals and values match up. Um, then they see like, hey, do I feel, feel anything for this person? Do I have any like emotional 
connection to this person? What am I feeling? And if, um, you know, the head's already there because they've already decided before they go out that this could be a good idea. Um, emotionally, after going out, they'll decide that I'm feeling it. And I think this guy is awesome. This girl's really great. Like I can see myself being with this person. Um, and then the last part is really that physical piece, which, you know, is left till after marriage is kind of like the, you know, the gravy on top, the dessert after we, we get the, the main course in. So we want to make sure that we're not just going for somebody because we're so attracted to them or because they're a doctor or because they have a lot of money, which later on couldn't really fail us. Um, when we realize like, Hey, you know what? My needs are not being met in this relationship. So one thing that I use kind of frequently is encouraging people to really focus on what they need in a relationship as opposed to what they want. Um, and what often happens is, is that people, well, first of all, what we need in a relationship is not negotiable. So what we need in a relationship are things that if we didn't have X, this relationship can't survive. So for instance, like I need a deep emotional relationship with someone who really understands me and could really communicate well, let's say. But um, if I go out with somebody and I think he's really cute and, you know, he spends a lot of money on me and he comes from a really illustrious family and, um, you know, he treats me really well, well, maybe I'll kind of give in on the fact that I don't really feel like we communicate so well. So that could be fine in the beginning, but once that relationship turns into a serious commitment, it's going to be a problem because ultimately someone's needs are not being met. And so ultimately there's a breakdown in the foundation of what really needs to be in a relationship for one side. Um, whereas wants are things that like, I would really want this, or I would really want that. And it would be really great to have, but if I didn't have that, this relationship could really survive um, just as well. Um, and so I think we often mix up and blur the wants versus needs. I want, I want, I want, although what we want might not be so good for us as opposed to what I actually need in a relationship. So I don't know if that clarifies anything, and I'm not quite sure if there are any questions about that, but that's kind of a little bit of a, you know, over summary of the differences between um, secular dating and traditional dating. So can I ask just uh, to close that loop, if you can describe um, how, how that ties into the shadchan, the matchmaker, oh, yeah. the shidduch date, okay. and, and what the whole deal is with like Nagia. Oh, that's scary. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so the shadchan is considered a matchmaker. Matchmaker, matchmaker. Anyway. So what um, is the Shana? Does the Shana always like this fat woman? Like, does she have to be like a, a, obese, morbidly obese? Yeah, morbidly obese. Yeah, she has to have, 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 yeah, she has to have a black book, morbidly <laughs> obese, and like socially awkward. As well. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, for example, today I had a couple that I was actually coaching both of them. I coach him and I coach her privately, separately. And I decided that they'd make a really great couple. So I decided to set both of them up and I actually know both of them very well. And it was their choice if they wanted to use me as a matchmaker, which they decided they did because it was one less phone call to have to make than have to call the matchmaker and call me because I'm their dating coach. So um, I said, hey, I, I know a lot about this girl. She's really awesome. I think it would be a great idea. Here is her information. So typically there is like some sort of profile that people fill out uh, what you do, what you're looking for, a little bit about yourself, you know, a little bit about your background, your family and references to check. And so I sent that to him. So I would be considered the, the matchmaker. Okay. And he called all her references. He called a bunch of people in the area that he knew that would know her. They, 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 you know, go to the similar synagogue in the same area and he called me back. He's like, I'm in. Sounds like exactly what I'm looking for. I saw a picture. She's pretty. I want to go out with her. So I said, all right, good. I got a green light from you. I went to her and I said, hey, there's this guy that I know. And uh, here's his information. Take as much time as you want. Check him out. Look into him. And she got back to me within a week. And she's like, okay, I called his references and everything I heard lined up. And seems like we've got a lot of things in common, you know, spiritually, we're in the same place. He's a smart guy. He's got a good job. He's, you know, spiritually connected, he comes from a good family. Like, yeah, I'm in. So they both decide to go out. Now, obviously COVID being just awkward for dating, um, they're actually dating over Zoom with like phone calls and Zoom and going on virtual tours to different museums together. And he's like sending her dinner through like Uber Eats and like they're having dinner over Zoom together, you know, so that's a little bit weird. But so I would be the matchmaker and a shidduch date would be essentially a date. Okay. It's basically any date, not on Zoom, typically face to face, um, where you could really go wherever you like on a date. The only caveat is there's no touching. Now I know this sounds quite 
quite frightful for most. But the reason why it actually works so well is that when you are focused on getting married, you want to make sure that someone is dating you because they like you and not just because they want to be all over you. Um, especially the girls, right? Guys, I know you don't like me so much right now. It's okay. It's in your benefit too. Um, so, um, you know, it really helps everybody focus. And one of the things you were talking about before is like minimizing the pain of relationships. One way we can minimize the pain of relationships like significantly is when we go out with somebody, if they don't touch us, then they're just getting to know us. Now, if they don't like us, we just say goodbye and we've spared a lot of pain. If they do like us, then they're going to hang on for the long haul and they're not going to be messing around with commitment because this is serious. And if you actually want me, you're going to have to actually marry me. So that's like, you better be serious about me, dude. Now, I understand that in the secular society that many of us live in, it seems like completely out of touch with reality and like no guy is ever going to be able to commit to this. Um, and my answer to that is it's not true. Um, we get the love we think we deserve. And if we think that we deserve a low level love, love that deserve. quote, by the way, <laughs> sorry, we, we get the love we think we deserve. That's a good quote. Yeah. We get the love we think we deserve. Right. So if I walk into a bar and I want a one night stand, I could get what I think is love for one night, but like, I, I obviously decided that I wanted a lower level love and I could get that or I can hold out and say, mm, no, I'm not going to go for a lower level love. I've decided I'm going to hold out for a higher level love. Like um, I think Samantha was saying where somebody respects me that they would love me and do more for me than I would even do for myself, that they want to help me be a better version of myself. Right. These are all qualities of a higher level love, which is obviously much more sustainable long-term and much more deep and meaningful and fulfilling uh, for a longer lasting um, relationship. So I get that this sounds completely like out there. Um, and so what I typically tell people is that if this is something that even piques their interest, you know, don't feel like you got to eat the entire elephant. But even if someone is not living in a society where this is the norm, there's still ways in which to like push off, you know, being physical, just so that I can at least get to know this person for who they are w without getting to be having that in, the, in between. Because once you add the physical piece, it's really complicated. First of all, you know, oxytocin hormones are just flying. So oxytocin, for those of you who don't know, is a bonding hormone. Like when you, when a mother has a baby and she nurses her baby, she gives off oxytocin, which is a bonding hormone, which makes her want to bond with her baby. It's also that comes something that a hormone that's released when two people are physical, um, which is great. It's great to be bonded. It's just, you want to make sure you're being bonded with someone who you actually want to be bonded to. Um, so- Have you ever had super glue like get stuck as you're trying to like use it and like you got to get the super glue off your you know, like, bloody mess. Remember that time, uh, Chai Esther, when uh, our sister Tehila got super glue in her eye? Oh and, gosh. And, and, and she had to go to it the- It was home. me. I got it in my eye. And oh, it was put you? It in my eye. Oh my gosh. Oh Okay, point being, I- yeah. Yeah, Here's we found reference. a little tube of glue and we thought it was uh, like uh, eye, eye drops. Like, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's horrible. Messed up. Okay, don't try this at home. Yeah, um, but like with relationships, people are sometimes, you know, putting super glue all over themselves. And <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, I often say like my job as a coach is to often help people not be a hazard to themselves. So I try to minimize people's pain in relationships so we can kind of focus on the goal and minimize the pain in terms of getting there, right? My tagline is the shortest distance to your longest relationship. So we try to, we try to keep true to that. Um, so like I said, even, even pushing off that physical aspect is so crucial in being able to get to know somebody because once you're already bonded to them, A, it's hard to kind of like get out and B, it's hard to see this clearly, right? You don't go to an interview drunk like if you had a really great op opportunity for an interview in a high, high, you know, high quality firm, you wouldn't like walk in hungover because that would just be inappropriate, unprofessional, and it wouldn't be putting you in your best, uh, in the best light, right? So when we go into a relationship, which is the biggest decision we're ever going to make, especially a long-term committed one, right? We want to make sure that we're giving ourselves the best chance possible and not walking in half drunk because I'm swimming in oxytocin, feeling bonded to this person that I'm not even sure I want to be connected to, or that would be right for me. So I hope that kind of hits those three points. Any questions? Yeah. So that? actually what I want to do, because we're sort of, uh, you know, oh, running okay. up against run time. No, the, run you know, no, no, that's good. So that, that pretty much wraps up the, the presentation. Um, you know, it's a huge topic. You, you can't possibly uh, give over 
all all the wisdom that that Judaism contains about relationships in in an hour, I mean, in a day, in a, in a, in a month. Uh, but what I wanted to do is to make sure to hit on some crucial points that we can hopefully make actionable, and uh, and and sort of reflect on them and say like, okay, is there is there some way I can use this definition of love? Is there some way I can think about like, well, you know, head before hand. But you know, th does that make sense? And if so, how how might I be able to use my head or like? Where do I want heart to be in relationship to hand and, and so on? So with that, I want to sort of open the floor up to you and uh, ask if, if you have any questions. And this is, you know, no no holds barred. So really, like any question is fair. Uh, no, we, we do not do it through a sheet. I just put that out there. Um, but really, it's, uh, it is, uh, yes, Rachel. Um, can I have your contact, Rachel? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, you can email me at Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, mm -hmm. um, at date great. D as in date, eight as in the number, G-R, like girl, Rachel, eight, dot com, date great dot com. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. You can check out my website, which is date great dot com. All kinds of fun blogs and articles, and you can sign up for free dating tips every two weeks if you like. Any other questions? Nathan, you raising your hand? No. Okay. Wow, they got it all figured out. Look at that. You were that good. Wow. Amazing. Huh. <laughs> well, hell, you were like head to oh, head. Oh yeah. To head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, must be. <laughs> no other questions on the topic of dating, love, relationships. Yeah. Why is it so taboo in the secular world to date so responsibly like this and actually try to connect with the person? So I can give you the nice answer or I can give you the deeper or tougher answer. Let's do the deeper one. Okay, so, and ladies, I, I hope you are gonna be okay because she asked for the deeper or tougher one. Um, I know this is gonna be really, really hard to hear, really painful to hear, but honestly, ladies, when I say ladies, I mean like across the world, you've, you've messed it up. You've really messed it up because you have sold yourself so cheap. And when everyone starts to sell themselves so cheap, it becomes the norm. And when we allow ourselves to be taken advantage of, guys are going to take whatever you give. So if everyone's given it, then every guy's taking it. And so when you're given it for free, I don't have to work for it. And so when women actually had standards, um, things were different. And when it was like a societal thing where women had standards. Men knew they had to work for it. Work for it means I need to get to know you. I need to treat you well. I have to show that I'm worthwhile. I have to show um, that I am trustworthy. I am to show that, show that I'm committed, that I can communicate in order to earn the right to be with you, even in a relationship, physical or otherwise. But because women across the board have sold themselves so cheap for so free, um, they've killed their chances. The good news, that, that's the bad news. The good news is, is that like, just like it went that direction, we can also backpedal and we can pull it back to where it should be, where, sorry, you're a great guy, but you're, we're, we're not, I'm not sleeping with you after a second date. Like, it's just not happening, right? I, I just don't do that. You're, you're welcome to find a girl who can do that, but not someone like me. If you want someone like me, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm worth it. I'm worth the wait. So if a woman, if, if women would be able to work on their own self-worth and their own self-esteem to realize how much they're actually in control in relationships, because they are completely in control. We like to play like we are the victim. We are the victim. In the reality, woman is completely in control, but she has to be able to use that control in order to use it to her benefit and make a man into a man. When you make a man into an animal, then he will be an animal. When you make a man into a man, he will be a man. So it's all about our own self-worth, our own self-esteem, our own belief in ourselves to say, I am worth it. And a guy's gonna need to work in order to get to know me, in order to build a relationship, to court me, to date me, to put effort into showing that this is the real deal and I'm not gonna choose to just give myself off for free. If a woman could do that, yeah, it's true. There'll be some guys who will say no, who just want like a cheap fast food burger, it's true. But a guy who's really worthwhile will actually hold out and then she'll get the love that she deserves. So it's really all in our control. Unfortunately, we live in a society and a culture that says, you're only worthy 
if you just offer yourself for free, if you wear clothes to nothing, if you prance around in a bar drunk, right? So we live in a culture that is, that's where that that's the norm. And so we feel like we have to live up to that because that's what everyone's doing. Um, and here's the thing, like I always say, like, how's that working for you ladies? For the most part, it isn't right. Most, I mean, I've spoken on campus before, like it's, it, people aren't so happy. Girls are not, women are not finding meaningful, deep relationships, long-term boyfriends that are really committed to them for a long-term relationship. They're not so happy, right? And so everyone feels like I gotta do this cause like that's what's done in order to get a guy, but they're not even really getting the guy. And, and after the whole experience is over, they feel gross, right? So. I wanna add just a couple of things from a, from a man's perspective. Um, one is. <laughs> Kind of done. Um, one is, I, I just want to clarify something, Rachel, when you said that the girls are totally in control, you're certainly not referring to those situations in which, unfortunately, women really are victimized like that. Clearly not. No, those situations are horrible. No, uh -huh. I, don't, I don't mean that at all. Obviously, those situations are horrible. I mean, they do happen, unfortunately, and they do far, happen. far more often than we would like to believe. Or, it's true. Or we'd like to, you know, but, but what you're saying is in, in, even in the world of consensual relationships, right. unfortunately, the dynamic is. And I also want to say something, you know, that that I don't believe it, a society like that brings out the best in men. That is to say, um, uh, the, the sort of like predatorial environment where, where, where the, um, the classic Don Juan is, is like, you know, the, um, the guy with the most notches on his belt and the one who, who succeeds in the game of dating uh, doesn't bring out uh, anything that will make men successful long-term in life. In other words, if, if you think, even if you don't care about women and about family and about relationships, here are the things that make, you know, I haven't worked in business and in consulting for a while. Here are the things that make people really worthwhile to do business with. And, you know, like, I, I'm going to say something controversial, political, maybe I shouldn't say it, but, you know, I, like I'm, I just believe what I say. Um, I don't believe that our president, it, whether you like his policies or not, I believe that he's, he's, um, his conduct is shameful. And I don't believe he's a good example of success in life. What I mean to say is that it is true that somebody who is a, is a, a human being with many, many deep flaws has succeeded to achieve the highest office in the country. But that, those are not the people that will succeed long-term in life. That is to say, you know, there are presidents people don't like, but they didn't have the passion hatred that people have towards a president. And again, like I happen to like plenty of his policies, et cetera. But I just, you know, I think we need to think about like, who are the men that we truly admire, right? Like, you know, w Bill Gates has suddenly become like a, like a phenom uh, during COVID-19. Uh, and Bill Gates is a phenom, not because like he predicted coronavirus, but because he built an amazing American company. He's one of the wealthiest person on the face of people on the face of the planet. And he spends all of his time being a decent human being. Like, he, he is, just imagine like what, what the kind of satisfaction, the rich life that a guy like Bill Gates has compared to even somebody as successful as our president. You know, just the, the web of relationships and of goodness that he's built into the world. I mean, the, the guy is a rock star of goodness and he's been able to achieve so many other things in life and, and, and you know, and build an amazing company, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, when, when Guys are incentivized to be people of commitment, to be uh, people of character, of integrity, of patience, of, of respect. Th th those skills that they build up will be there with them for life and will be so extraordinarily valuable. And then you're helping him become a better version of himself. Just my little rant, forgive me. I wouldn't offend anybody politically, sorry. <laughs> it's not meant to be a political statement, it's meant to be. Nathan's gotta... So how do you put it in action? Um, sorry? If, how do you put it in action if we have a broken system, which I agree um, that this system is broken, but it relies a lot on raising people a certain way, having people be exposed. And if they're not gonna be easily exposed, we said it, we said it's hard to, um, it's hard to give some, it's hard to want something that is not so close to you um, and to really reach for it. Um, if men aren't being tested um, and they're not being raised that way, then what is gonna change in Western society? 
Well, there's the global question and then there's the individual question, right? So to start with, you might just want to think about, well, how, I know this might seem a little bit far off, but like, how do you want to raise your son? How do you want to raise your daughter? Right. That goes, that goes back to like, well, how, how are you going to, what's the trajectory of your future going to look like so that you have a home that is giving over certain values to your children, that certain things are acceptable in this home and certain things are not. And raising your daughters to respect themselves and to appreciate their beauty, but to save it for the right person. Right. So it's going to go to your own personal values. Um, there are, there are many societies that this works very nicely for, um, but you have to understand that it, it's not an isolated um, effect. What I mean by that is when we live in a society where everything is kind of loose and anything goes, so we also, we, we enjoy the fact that we could do whatever we want, wear whatever we want, go where we want, you know, go on social media and say whatever we want. We also pay the price for that as well on the other end, right? So um, for instance, in my personal community, women don't wear whatever they want. Women dress in a way that is beautiful, attractive, uh, in style, but not attracting to the extent that they're going to put men in a position where they are focusing on things they shouldn't be focusing on. So a woman might say, oh, I feel you know, choked by that. I feel limited by that. You might, but when those boundaries are put in place, we create a whole society where the focus is different. The focus is on family. The focus is focus your energy um, and all your sexuality in your marriage, in your relationship, right? We raise our children this way, our sons a certain way, uh, our daughters a certain way. And so it creates a society where the focus is completely different. Rahul, do you have any uh, practical tips for somebody who's, who's not living in, I mean, the side. Right, so, so the first tip I would say is to start thinking about like, how would you want to raise your children? And if there are things that you were given that you'd want to do differently, like start thinking about that. Um, that would be A. B, the kind of women that you date before anything happens, you might want to have a conversation about this. Like, what, what are their views on this? What are, what are their views on, you know, how they see them, themselves in a relationship? Like what, what's their long-term goal here? Are they just looking to just have a fun fling for a couple of months? Are they looking for a long-term relationship? And this takes a lot of self-control, obviously, but with self-control, I mean, obviously, you know, any, any class or course that you've done well on, you've worked really hard on and had success in, it takes effort. It takes discipline. The world doesn't want to hear about discipline. The world wants to hear, I want to do whatever I want, when I want, how I want, and at the other end, I want to be happy. It doesn't work that way. You know, if, if you pour a lot of like spoiled ingredients into a cake, it is just not going to come out right. Right. So you might say like, I don't like to stop at a stop sign. I don't want to stop at a red light. I don't like traffic rules. I don't like the fact that when I speed, I get a ticket. Yeah. You might not like it, but it's saving your life. Right. So as a society, we have to start being more comfortable. I think getting more comfortable with this, with just basic self-discipline and being able to put certain things in place that will help protect us as a society long term, because um, unfortunately, like relationships are really going downhill in the U.S. So what I would say, Nathan, you know, as a as a guy, um, you have both men and women have, I think, uh, quite a bit of leverage um, if if they zag. I mean, when I was um, studying business, so one professor, he, he put it so simply, he's like, when everybody zigs, you zag, right? As essentially, that's your differentiator, right? The, the, the holy grail of business is to create a differentiated product, differentiated service. Like, what's your unique value proposition? How are you different than every other, right? So like we do services in the healthcare industry. Like there are, there are a gajillion companies that do services in the healthcare industry. What are we going to offer your company that's gonna give you a solution that you won't find elsewhere? Why should you go with us as opposed to somebody else? Um, if you are somebody who is willing to respect a woman for who she is and, and view that as the, as the center of your relationship with her, you are gonna find a lot of women who will, will be uh, thrilled to find that in a guy. And for women who, um, who are capable of holding out, and I can't speak to you know not not being a woman, but who will uh, create those sort of bumpers about uh, the structure in which they choose to enter into a relationship, for the right kind of guy, that's gonna be like, whoa, whoa, like now this is a whole different kind of a person than uh, th this kind of dignity, this kind of self-respect, this kind of um, uh, 
this, this internal strength, this uh, sort of feminine power, like, whoa, I, I haven't seen that many places. So I would say both men and women who zag when everybody else is zigging um, uh, have uh, an ability to create a uniquely differentiated position for themselves in the world of dating and relationships. And yeah, sorry, I think you had a question. I, I'm speaking less about myself and more for like society as a whole. Like I'm not speaking on behalf of society, but like speaking, with, speaking thinking about that. Um, could you not say there's a lot of evidence that this generation of women is a lot more empowered um, and we, you mentioned the, the way people dress. Um, I think that's a source of great empowerment for a lot of people. Um, and understanding histories of like nuclear families in America and in Western society, you see a lot of time um, women in the household can be relegated to secondhand work around the house. Um, I, I've been I've been lucky to understand this and it's preposterous. Um, and, but I, I think also you, uh, in the beginning we touched on um, like, are you looking for a lower level love or a higher level love? If, if that is the, the, the spectrum we're judging by, um, I think people are looking less for a higher level love, not necessarily as their end goal, but maybe at the expense of something like increased self-worth. Um, and it might just be that, that this is like a testing ground, that this is a new time for that. Um, but I think we are generally trending towards a society where um, you have people um, who are, are, are looking to respect um, the people around them. I, I, that might be projecting, but, but. Well, typically what happens is, is that when the pendulum swings all the way to one extreme and, you know, it's so extreme and it's not working that it starts to swing back. Like in history, that's typically what tends to happen. You know, I, I do, I do believe that across campuses, there needs to be like a movement, you know, like in the eighties, it was like, say no to drugs. You know, I feel like it needs to be like, say no to sex. I seriously, I think it needs to be a movement. To protect, to protect just men and women, men and women. I'm not just saying just women. Um, but I do agree with you that people are going for a lower level of. Um, a, let's just call it out, it's easier. It takes less effort, it takes less discipline. It's a quick, fast burger. It's easy, it's there. Hey, why not? Um, people, I think, trick themselves into feeling empowered by that. Like, oh yeah, like you're like saying, how many notches on my belt, slept with this one, that one. Um, long term, I don't feel that people are happier because of it. Um, I will tell you that one of my close friends, um, I have a close friend who's a, a sex therapist. And one of the things that she deals with is um, couples who are finally married and have had many, many relationships before marriage. Um, and they're having a really hard time, like physically and emotionally connecting to each other because their literal connection has been blunted so much by having so many partners that it really affects their relationship. And so I worry that when couples actually do settle down, they're not getting that high quality connection that they actually could if they had been a little bit more discerning by who they were with. Um, I do think that, you know, globally, it should become a movement. I don't know who's going to start it, but like, you know, we've had lots of movements that everyone thought like, oh my goodness, am I the only person who thinks I'm a woman and I should vote? And hey, look, you know, the feminist movement was born. It happened. Um, so I do think that that's definitely, definitely an issue that people are having a lower level of. Also, the reason why there's a lower level love kind of more, it's more accessible. It's also that people tend to attract where they're at at the moment. So if a woman is feeling like, oh, I don't deserve a higher level love, no guy's going to ever you know, treat me with the great respect that I deserve, um, then she's going to get the relationship that she kind of, the, the energy she puts out is what she's going to get. So if she doesn't think she deserves it, she, she won't get it. Um, unfortunately, I think the big relationship crisis is right, the breakdown of the family unit across the U.S., right? So most people look to a relationship paradigm in terms of how they should model um, what they should be looking for. So for instance, like Samantha talked about the beautiful relationship of, of her parents. Um, and that's a very beautiful, healthy paradigm. So you see that and you know that you want that, but that is not typical. 
for your classic, typical, um, you know, college kid to say, my parents have a beautiful marriage where they respect each other and they give more of themselves and they make each other better versions of themselves. That's not typical. If we had that and less um, divorce and, you know, breakdown of the family unit a whole, I think that it would be more helpful for children to be able to follow in their parents' footsteps and know, what am I going to emulate? Because most kids today don't have what to emulate. That's where they come to me. They want me to explain to them what does a healthy relationship look like because they don't have an idea and they've never seen one. Like I have many clients who have never seen it with their parents, their grandparents, all of their friends' parents are divorced. Like they just don't even know what it's supposed to look like. So how are you supposed to recreate that? That's can a I, huge problem. Can I ask a question? Or yeah, please. A it, it's a comment and then a question. So I had that with my parents, but I did not and do not have a good relationship with them. And I have made I, I put too much on myself, but like really terrible relationship choices habitually. And I think that I am the epitome of someone that is like deeply wounded and I'm not dating anyone now and haven't for a while, but how do you, you know, shift into that healing mode? Because I, you talk about the pendulum swinging. I had the epitome of like a good example from, you know, a solid family unit that was intact. And then I dated that like I made terrible dating choices and I feel deeply wounded. And I think that I feel at some times almost like used up or, you know, there's sort of like no return, you know, how do I get back to that? And obviously, you know, you do what you can with what you have today. And like, I don't make those choices anymore, but how do you move toward, like toward a, I know now what not to do, but how do you sort of come back from that and move toward not making those terrible decisions anymore, if that makes sense. So this is obviously like a longer question that I would love to speak to you more privately about, but yeah. in general, just in terms of like, just giving a public answer, you know, a relationship is not a hospital. It's never going to heal you. So the most important thing is to really heal yourself before you enter the next relationship so that a you attract a better quality relationship and that b you're not bringing your rolly suitcase of um of hurt and pain and and poor self-esteem and all the wounds you don't want to be dragging it in with you because it's not the responsibility of your partner to heal that for you it's your responsibility to heal yourself it's their responsibility to heal themselves and together you could build something beautiful together when everybody is healthy. Like, like I said, the, the breakdown of the family unit has really like generationally adapted what people look at relationships like. And it's, it's very sad because we just, children are growing up in broken homes. They don't have a paradigm for two parents and it's very hard to recreate that. So what they end up recreating is the bad choices of their parents because that's all they saw. Or now I'm attracted to an abusive guy because my dad was abusive to my mom. This is horrible, right? So the breakdown of the family unit is causing tremendous instability in the home. And then it's not just the home, it's now the home that that child is going to build in their future. And so we've got this explosion of unhealthy relationships and unhealthy homes. But the good news is that just like we got this way, we could backpedal and we could go the can, other direction. Can you share the example of the, the couple that just got engaged, the, each of them, the, the, the relationships that they had come from? Ooh. That couple? Uh, I've got a few, which one? Uh, which one? Oh. Right, how they each came from from you know deeply wounded. Yeah, I have you know a girl who came from a uh, broken home. Her mom had been married multiple times. Her dad had been married multiple times, and each of them had multiple. Her father, mother had been married three times. Her father had been married four times. There was some mental illness in mental illness in the family, um, and she decided like this is not going to be me, right? And she did a tremendous amount of work on herself. To her credit, she is a very mature individual who's really worked very hard on herself, and he's come from a home of also their, you know, his parents were divorced and a lot of turmoil in their, her, his parents' current marriage. And, you know, um, and he also did a tremendous amount of work and said, this is not going to be me. He went to therapy. He hung around happily married families and couples. Um, and he works with me like all the time. And he's like, you just give me whatever homework I got to do. I need, I will not settle for anything but a healthy relationship. And he's done a tremendous amount of work just with me alone, aside from everyone else that he's been working with. Um, and he, they're happily engaged and they're wonderful and they really can't rely on their families because both of their families don't have stable homes, but they're going to have a beautiful home. They really will. And so something that I credit. find so, so adorable. And, and the truth is, you know, it's not just um, family of origin problems that people can, can overcome and can, can heal from. It's, it's, you know, and anything that, any decisions and choices that we've made, uh, we can overcome with the same, 
you know, um, there's this amazing, amazing quote from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, a great Hasidic Rebbe. He says, Im tama amin shef kel. If you believe that you can destroy, tamin shef then at least you should believe that you can heal. Right? If we believe in destruction, at least we should be, believe in the ability to heal and believe, ability to improve. And this couple, I mean, they both, you know, I, I, I sort of like, find out about these relationships. Like, you know, I, I don't know, I, each one of these relationships has like code names. I have no idea who these people are. Um, but uh, they, they, they met each other. They, they're so happy together. You know, they can't wait to get married. Like during this crisis, they're gonna like I've got figure all out these couples that are engaged now and they don't know what to do. Like, should we wait to have a wedding? Should we just have like this small little 10 person wedding? Like they just wanna be married. Right, so these yeah. two, they're just like, they don't need the fanfare. They don't so, need like, the- We just the wanna be with that. each other. They're just gonna like figure people. out, as soon as they can get 10 people together, they're just gonna get married in the backyard. And, and, <laughs> like, anyway, yeah. Nathan, so. looks like you had something to add. Uh, I think I'm good. Did I fully <laughs> answer? I, 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 I still have, I mean, I don't want to take up Go for more it. time, but I, I still, there's part of me that sees um, at least secular society in the U.S. being very dominated by like Christian and Catholic values. Um, and in those, speaking about those households in particular, that's very, those are very patriarchal um, households where, um, a woman's place is purportedly in the house. Okay. Um, and I think that being a lot of the infrastructure in the U.S., um, that breeds the culture. And I don't think it's um, as much something in Jewish culture, but I do think it's something that like really becomes a staple of secular society, um, those ideas. And that I think in that regard, um, something like increased independence and um, like increased bodily autonomy. I think those kinds of things um, go beyond just being like a protest measure. I think those things are um, like essential for this time period now and probably will be forever, but especially this time now um, as like a reaction and adjustment to the norm. And the norm then will be Ideal, an ideal situation where people can, my, my thought basically is, I, I think I see the system as self-correcting. Like I think the, the divorce rates that are so, so high, I agree um, that there are pendulum swings. I see that as not being um, something that is like a societal ill. I see that being a reaction to a lot of people looking for what we should be looking, which is a healthy, deep connection and seeing they don't have it. And I think that's a hard thing to recognize and maybe even that should be applauded. Um, so, so you could be right that the pendulum is swinging. The question is, is it fast enough? Because while it's swinging, there are a lot of people that are going through a tremendous amount of pain. You know, children are going through a lot of divorce, couples that are going through multiple divorces until they figure out who they are, what they're actually looking for, and actually find that meaningful relationship. So why? Why, do, why does someone have to go through two, three divorces until they find that person? Couldn't we figure out a way to make it a little easier and less painful and more efficient so that we don't have to go through all that pain? Um, but I wanted to just address something you talked about, like the empowerment, right? So I, I think that women are definitely much more empowered than they ever were. The question is, what are they doing with that empowerment, right? So I feel quite empowered as a Jewish woman. I really do. Um, I've got, you know, a full-time job as an occupational therapist. I've got two home businesses uh, as, a, as a dating coach and, and another side business. So um, I, I'm, I don't find myself chained to the kitchen floor. Am I chained to the kitchen floor? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I have, him, I have him do chores, you know, he does them. But, you know, um, at the end of the day, if you would ask me who, what I feel my main job is, like overall, like mom is the job that I would want to be known for, for sure. Like mother, I don't think there ever was a time that mothers were most respected than like COVID, you know, like this meme that went around, like, you know, uh, and never again did, everyone, did anyone ever ask, like, what does a mother do all day, right? So now that you're home all day and like a mom's like doing laundry and cooking and homeschooling and watching kids. That you, so yeah, being a mom is a really, really meaningful, deeply 
you know, a, a full-time head-on job. But um, in the Jewish world, at least, like, I don't know, I personally don't know of any, like, friends of mine in my social circles who don't work. And if they don't work, like, couldn't work if they wanted to. Like, I don't find that to be, you know, I don't, I don't really know of any change to the kitchen floor. You know, that I don't, I don't really have any friends like that. Well, you know, I think maybe what you bring up is, it's a question that has a, a lot of different layers. You, you, we, we would have to unpack that. And so you're bringing up many issues that are all relevant to the, to the conversation, but they're all their, their own individual conversations. So like the place of uh, not just Christian teaching, but puritanical Christian teaching in shaping the American founding and shaping American history to this day. Um, the advantages of a patriarchal society for um, all sorts of structures. Or it's just like if you take something simply, you know, I had a, a teacher he, he pointed this out. It was so fascinating to me. He said, you know, don't you find it interesting that in the mid 1800s, all of the moral degenerates in the United States, they lived down South. And all of the like morally upright people, like all of the people who you know, were enlightened and, and had a, some sense of like moral being, they all happen to live in the North, right? Isn't that a wild thing? I was like, the point that he was making is that, you know, even something as, uh, as horrific as slavery, there are many different reasons why people can be willing to go along with a, a society that allows for slavery. Um, and we can't assume that just because people were in the South, they were moral degenerates, right? I'm not, I'm not advocating for slavery, but it's a, it's a really complex question. So, you know, uh, Christianity, um, uh, the, the role of women in society, uh, the, the, the power dynamics in society, um, the way in which uh, a person's dress, and in particular, their expression of their sexuality through dress, affects their, self, affects their self-esteem and their self-definition. Um, the, the way in which uh, we define people externally, and those are all factors. Um, and you know, I, I, you're asking a very layered question, and I feel like I, I almost any answer I would give you um, in brief would be would, would do a hatchet job on a correct response to, uh, to to what you're searching for. You're searching for something profound, like you, you're bringing up all the right points, but um, I don't. Uh, I, I can't possibly respond to such a complex question with a simple answer. Is that fair? Right, I think that is fair. Um, I think on an individual basis, um, if I were to impart the change that I believe is necessary and have seen and have seen from positive role models, um, I know the family I would wanna raise. I know the relationships I wanna foster. Um, they would look like a lot like the borderline utopian um, American society that I'd like to live in. Um, I do agree that it's a larger... But there's the rub, Nathan. How do you create a, a utopian society, right? Haven't we been trying to do that since the American founding? Right. And, we, and we've been failing, right? So, and, and you can't, you, it takes a village to raise a child. You simply can't live in a vacuum. I mean, unless you're gonna, you know, like Walden, you know, Thoreau, just hang out by a river someplace and, and like homeschool your kids, uh, in, in loincloths, you know, you're going to be living in a society and you're necessarily going to be impacted by everything around you. So that, that is, that becomes the question then, right? So, uh, you know, in your mind, you have this ideal that's fantastic, but then how are you going to actually going to translate that? And maybe the very first question is based on our discussion tonight is, well, who is, who is going to be, you know, who's going to be your co-pilot or to whom are you going to be a co-pilot as you navigate this, right? It, it takes two people to fly that plane, that fly, family plane. And it, it takes a good airport to be able to fly it into, right? If you fly into Sarajevo during the, you know, the bombings, it's gonna suck no matter how good of a pilot you are. So what port are you coming from? What port are you flying to? And who are you flying the plane with? And that's something that you can actually embrace right now is to identify like, what is it that I need to be able to build that family? And, and you need a partner with whom you can build in that way. And, and that is something you can completely impact right now. And you can start building it literally today and literally by, by starting to make decisions about how you think about relationships and how you pursue relationships and how you act in your relationship as it's unfolding will impact you know, the next month of that relationship, the next six months, the next six years and, and 60 years. 
it might seem crazy, but remember, it's like people who say like, well, I'm going to marry Jewish, but I, I date non-Jewish. So like, okay, riddle me this. So, okay, last time I checked, dating, nobody ever married, except for on The Bachelor, nobody ever married before they dated, right? So how is it that you, you're going to date somebody, what, and it's going to go well, it's going to go really well, and you're going to like them a lot, and like, at some point you'll be like, whoa! Okay, just like slam on the emergency brake. Hell no, forget it. Um, I'm out of here. You're not Jewish. Like that's insanity. In other words, every relationship you're in is one step closer towards a more meaningful relationship, a more meaningful relationship. Every deeply committed marriage began with a step. And how you make that step today is going to make a difference every other step on that journey. I, I agree. I, I agree. I agree. Awesome. All right. All right. Okay. Well, it has been such a pleasure to meet all of you. I, I feel terrible when I will meet in person, maybe someday, who knows when this is over really One soon. Day we'll actually see humans again. That'd be great. <laughs> It'd be awesome. In the meantime, we don't have to worry about touching any guys or girls. There's no one to come near at all. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, Avi and Rafael, thank you so much. Pleasure. Bye. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you for your wisdom and sharing that with us. And well, you guys, um, thank you so much for joining us. We miss you all so much. Um, as wonderful as, uh, you know, our, our online uh, modalities are, uh, we miss just seeing you guys and hanging out and feeding you. And <laughs> um, gosh, this is, I cannot wait for this all to be over. But uh, for for the time being, it's so great to see you and having our uh, our weekly meetings, and uh, we miss you and uh, and uh, happy Passover to you all. Yeah, enjoy the rest of your holiday, everybody. And I, I would say, feel free if anyone wants to reach out with a question, or an email, whatever. You can feel free to reach out. Rachel has the email. It's it, we yeah. reach out to you. Kaya knows how to find us. Yeah, you can contact Kaya Rachel at Date Great. We, or... we don't screen her calls. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, take care. All the best. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Brianna, Maddie, Rachel, Becca, Charles. So good to see you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.